I get a phone call. Hey, remember all those projects we've been doing? I've now got a big one for you. I'm one of these people that likes change. Not everyone does, but yeah. I see change as an opportunity and not as a, a, a not as a threat. You're swimming in a lane where the challenges you're going to face are the ones that um, are going to grow your gaps, um, but also take advantage of your strengths. And through a lot of late nights, a lot of arguments, <laughs> and a lot of um, um, disagreements and whiteboard sessions, I was forced to kind of learn. And I've taken that with me forever, which is the world is shades of grey. You keep hunting for black and white, you keep thinking there's the perfect answer, but let me tell you there isn't the perfect answer. And so if you can't get comfortable playing the grey space, then you better change careers very quickly. Oh, gosh. That wasn't on the pre-brief. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the world is geared up in a way to make you feel like... On today's show, we have a true tech titan, Darren Klein. Darren's career saw him start out life as an accountant with KPMG before moving into a career in financial services and then into the world of big data and analytics, working for some amazing companies such as Westpac, ANZ, Investec, Tabcor, MLC Life, and Two Spells with NAB. Darren has a natural curiosity for the world around him, and this has opened up many doors where he has created significant business value through data and transformation. Today, he shares his outlook on the world of technology, including his new passion, Gen AI. So Darren, thank you. Thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. Um, but you're a pretty modest guy, but I'm going to put it out there and I think you've had a, a fantastic career. Uh, and I also think you're a, a great example of someone that has built an impressive track record in one domain and then you've kind of morphed that into another and then another. Uh, and that's kind of seen you kind of specifically move, probably not in traditional technology, but, but in that kind of world of data analytics. Um, but I noticed it all began way back, University of New South Wales, and a degree in uh, accounting and finance. Um, so what, what kind of inspired that course selection at that point in your life? Yeah, it's not, um, not the most traditional undergraduate degree for a, um, a person that spends their life in, tech, in around technology, I agree. Yeah. I think at the time um, I was uh, not, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and probably still a running theme today, but at that stage it was even more pronounced. Um, and I was encouraged because I'd just done some work experience with accounting firms. Yeah. If I got into accounting and finance, I could then figure out what to do next. Yep. So um, the, the path was a cadetship through one, what was then Pete Marwick Hungerford's now called KPMG. Yep. That's how old I am. Um, and so it was really like a, a, a launch pad idea to just get started with commerce and accounting um, and take it from there. And fair enough, like within a year of qualifying as a chartered accountant, I hated it. So. It was, it was the right call, <laughs> but it was only ever going to be a launch pad kind of opportunity. Um, but it was always um, um, uh, my, my interest in technology even then was always a hobby as opposed to yeah, okay. a thirst for a career. I had played around with computers. I used to sell them at Dick Smith's as a part-time <laughs> person when laptops or, sorry, portables as, as, they, as they were in those days with the yep. size of suitcases. So it always been in and around technology, but never enough for it to be a career passion and because I didn't have enough knowledge about the profession I wanted to be in, kind of commerce and accounting just seemed to be the, the natural thing. So that's where I started. Yeah, right. Okay. And you mentioned that there was the kind of cadetship, which I, I didn't realise, I did spot from your LinkedIn that your time at KPMG overlapped with university. So I, sh I assume there was some some kind of connection there. Uh, and I kind of saw that post-university, it was what you described as business advisory, yeah. I think. So my, my sense then from what you've just said as well is that that sounded like you started to step at that point away from accounting. So what, what did that kind of, you know, what did that involve for you? So I think, uh, I, think I came to the realisation early on when I was learning, um, the whole accounting domain was brilliant as a, as a 19, 20 year old school leaver. The speed at which I learnt commerce, business, understanding business operating models, because I was in the uh, accounting division, not the audit division. So I got very hands on in building cash flows and financial statements for yeah. companies. So <coughs> I, I learnt very quickly how much I did love actually just just the commercial um, uh, drivers for business and what made businesses successful. Um, we were close to the liquidation team back in those days. That was the recession the last time Australia had back when I graduated. <laughs> so, so I saw a lot of practical stuff that did interest me around what made companies successful or not successful. Um, and so I realised that just being a pure accountant was not my exciting path. It felt like I was bayoneting the wounded after the war as one. Yep. And so that's when I started to think I want to get more involved in more finance where I can take accounting knowledge and blend it with um, 
finance and look more forward. So so I already started wanting to get involved in, as soon as I qualified as a chartered accountant, I knew I wanted yep. to be involved in banking because <laughs> I figured at least with banking I could take accounting knowledge, which was all the corporate knowledge about a company, but then start providing finance and lending to it and all that sort of stuff to hopefully help the company grow and make more money. It was kind of like the objective. Yeah, okay, it's interesting. And I think uh, from, from something we were discussing actually earlier, even in that time at KPMG, you got to kind of tinker in the world of tech with, with a, an implementation project. Is that, is that right? Yeah, so, um, so the, um, the partners at KPMG were, were keen for me to stay connected to the firm. So I switched from being in um, an accounting division into their consulting division. And because I said I wanted to be involved in banking and finance, they put me into what was in the treasury risk division. Yep. So the consulting work we were doing was to go to work with investment banks yep. to help them build platforms and systems for measuring in those days market risk. So back in the 90s, um, under the early Basel regime, yep. banks for the first time, because there were things like Russian bond crisis and, and other events, it, it became obvious that banks weren't properly measuring the derivative risk in their, in their derivative books. Yep. And so consulting companies like KPMG and the others, Anderson Consulting when it was around those days, had had a long run of engagements in, and um, consulting opportunities to go and help all of these banks figure out how to comply with the new regulatory rules that were coming yep. and how to install all of these platforms for being able to um, measure the market risk, which is ex- extensive because the risk platforms banks needed needed to be more sophisticated and have more technology grunt than the actual um, trading platforms because right. they needed to actually revalue every trade um, which you need to do to price a trade, yep. but not just revalue it then, but be able to revalue it back the last 500 days yep. and collect all of the interest rates and currencies and all of the other pricing inputs um, and then run all these calculations. So the size and complexity of the technology that the banks needed to run their risk systems in those days was actually bigger than their trading platforms. Yeah, interesting. So that's a kind of form of emerging technology at that point in time, um, albeit awesome. different to the kind of tech we talk about today. Um, but still, at that point, becoming influential as a driver in, in, in terms of the way that an industry would, would be able to operate. Um, it's also interesting there, just reflecting as you were talking, uh, that, that I think for a lot of people, particularly as they're going through university at that stage, I guess I'm you know, focused on that stage in your life, um, it, it's kind of hard to imagine most jobs in the workplace. Uh, you can see an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor or, or whatever, right? But you kind of got through that path into the traditional accountancy route, knowing that you wanted to go into that banking and finance. But my sense is through getting exposure into those organisations as a consultant, you actually understood the roles as well and yep. where, what, what you were passionate about. Is that is that kind of fair assessment? Yeah, so I think um, I, was, um, I was an early pioneer for building an, ag- an agile career. So <laughs> in the 90s, it wasn't fashionable, but I had, I had five employers in 11 years. Uh, in five, 11 or 12 years. So back then, a lot of people uh, gave me some strong advice that, hang on, Darren, you know, that's not the done thing. You should be spending at least 10 years at, at each company you invest in. So in the 90s, I actually, because I had this thirst to keep um, at the frontier of what was what was new and emerging um, and, you know, partnerships and relationships I'd built, it meant that as a consequence, I kept, I kept moving forward into... I had I had a kind of direction I wanted to go. I wanted to be around finance and banking. I wanted to yeah. be around, and that of course meant technology because it was powered by technology. And so <coughs> you know the consulting uh, work I did with KPMG included a bunch of risk systems. Then eventually, when ANZ lost too much money with the Russian bond crisis, and then replaced their chief risk officer, the tr- the director of KPMG that was running the treasury practice suddenly became the market risk um, executive for ANZ. Then suddenly he needed to implement a major pr- platform for risk. So then all of a, all of a yeah. sudden I get a phone call. Hey, remember all those projects we've been doing? I've now got a big one for you. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, you know, step by step, um, I'd move from, um, from different roles and then all of a sudden now I'm working for ANZ. I'm now actually an employee of a bank. I'm no longer a consultant, yeah, just okay. running projects for a bank. So even though the uh, numbers of roles and the, and the employers may have changed, the kind of direction around getting stronger and um, more in-depth in the delivery of banking solutions that were driven mainly in those days by risk and technology was, was a fairly consistent theme. Yeah, okay, it's interesting. Because, again, something I was going to ask you, which, is, which, which I think I kind of had it here as 11 years or, or 12 years, and you were kind of in audit, risk, commercial finance, across Westpac, ANZ, Investec. Um, and I was looking at that and thinking, you know, how did you how did you kind of navigate that, and and how did you know when it was time to move from one role to the next? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> um, 
So um, most of the time in that in that first fifteen to twenty years, um, I was I was um, what's the right word semi productive in keeping an eye on what's the next role. So I, d- yeah. I, I did always say, well, when I finish this particular program project, and to be fair. I, for whatever reason, personality style, I did lean towards taking the risk to run projects or lead projects. Yep. And maybe because I just, from my KPMG consulting days early on in my early career, I just found that there's the combination of the intellectual stimulation, the adrenaline rush of yep. trying to get it all done, and then the accolades if you can actually get a project delivered somewhere on time and somewhere on budget. Um, but I think just the sheer fact that it was always, you know, big projects were always at the forefront of change, and I enjoyed. I'm one of these people that likes change. Not everyone does, but yep. I see change as an opportunity and not as a, a, a not as a threat. So, um, so for me, projects seem to be the right thing. So, and invariably, they had a, a finite timetable. So they tend to be large enough. They were always usually taking a couple of years more. But by the time that last six months was coming to a close, and hopefully I was on track and things were going okay, I was already starting to think about where my next my next gig was going to be. And so. So when the market risk program at ANZ wrapped up, was coming to a, a close after three years because I spent a year building the business case and getting the funding approval and getting the, um, the board over the line and actually funding the project, and then I spent two years implementing it. Um, then the bank was already talking to me about, hey, we've got this thing called Basel. Would, yeah. you, would you like to be the program manager for Basel? And if you recall the earlier part of the conversation, I'm like, I like being close to the interface between where and how yeah. the bank makes money and how it serves customers. And for me at that point, I was probably uh, more ambitious around being an executive at a bank. And my thought at that stage was, if I don't start selling products and services to customers, it's going to be harder for me to you know, climb the banking kind of leadership ladder from the back office or middle office, which is where I was playing a role. Yeah. And so I was definitely trying to look for a role where I could be more in the front, the front of, the, of the business selling products. That's interesting. I, I, I kind of sense there the, a real kind of mindful job crafting Correct. to a certain degree of, of the way you were looking to navigate. Was, was anybody, were you looking to anybody there to mentor you or, or advise you or was this kind of through your own um, self-reflection? Um, I think um, in my early KPMG career, I had some great managers and great partners. Yeah. And the economic model of, a, of, a, of an accounting business back in those days, which I don't think has changed, is they had they charged very high daily rates yeah. for very underpaid <laughs> resources, <laughs> and and what they managed very very well was the was the learning and development curve of junior resources, and so if you were um, prepared to do some extra homework and and really test your intellect and be ambitious enough to go after interesting projects, the accounting and the consulting firms really throw you into the mix, and I think. Yep. Um, and so the partners and managers in those days were always encouraging you to have a go. And they were comfortable because the frameworks that the consulting firms had had really good safety nets yeah. to give people the opportunity to really stretch their legs into into new engagements or big, bigger engagements that may, may ordinarily have been slightly past their area of competence. But with the network around them and the frameworks that those firms had, there was always a, a degree of safety that allowed them. So I think, um, so I, think I learned early that it was okay and acceptable to look at a big, a big opportunity and walk into it rather than walk away from it. So yeah. it wasn't it wasn't necessarily any one particular individual me saying, "Hey, don't get trapped in a middle office role." Yeah, I think it was just more the fact that I'd been um, fortunate enough to be put on leadership programs, particularly at ANZ early on because of the success, success I was having in my project. And so I think I was just surrounded by good quality leaders. Yeah, in my view, as I wanted to be one of those good quality leaders, I was impassioned to try and grow people and grow teams. Um, and so, you know, the ultimate pinnacle for that is the is the C-suite of, a, of, a, of an organisation. So, so that, that you, it kind of leads on quite nicely to my next question. I was going to ask, which was uh, was leadership natural to you? Yeah, I think it was. Um, and my um, and I don't know why. I don't have any yeah. um, secret sauce for that. But um, but I was very sporting and very competitive as a young as a young teenager. So uh, did a lot of representative sport. Um, yeah. Uh, and I had, a, I had a combination of individual sport um, in swimming and in athletics, but also a lot of a lot of team sport, particularly in soccer or what some nationalities would call football. I don't even that debate. And also um, <laughs> and baseball of all things. And okay. and so invariably, whether it was through the school sporting system or, or the club sporting system, typically I, I I occupied a leadership role in sport. 
and so I think I connected um, the the kind of joy and fun of taking on a an accountability to lead teams yeah. and success because in sport the good thing about the sport is if you can get the team to work together and you just get the work done yeah. generally you can measure success whether, whether that actually is winning the grand final or just getting better each week and your stats get better I learned early on that, that if you can um, bring a team together do the homework improve the method on which you're doing the work even if it's as simple as you know playing baseball or yeah. any of those sorts of things I think I, th- I just learned early on that I just I love that space yeah, so. okay. So that's interesting. So maybe um, it, not in a contrived way, but you had a philosophy about what leadership looked like yep. and what it stood for. Uh, and again, it's another interesting trend that you you know see a lot of um, tech titans or tech leaders uh, have some kind of high high performance sport yep. or high performance culture at some somewhere in their background that it's probably shaped them, um, nurtured them. I think I wasn't going to give you a name, but I will this time. So, <laughs> so the one person that did influence me strongly at the time, it was just at the right time. In my late 20s, when I was running this major project at ANZ, so three, a, a three-year program of work worth, I don't know, 20 million bucks or something at the time, which sounds cheap today, but back then it wasn't. John McFarlane was the CEO of ANZ, and he brought in, I think it was McKinsey at the time, to do a whole cultural revolution around leadership in the ANZ Bank. And the thing that made John McFarlane different to the other CEOs that I'd worked in and around was John used to lecture and did undergraduate and postgraduate studies in goal setting and leadership. Yep. So at ANZ, what was unique was there was a CEO of the organisation who was personally passionate about growing leaders. Yeah, okay. And it just happened at just the right time where I'm looking to kind of step out of being the technical expert. Yep. I'm now running a, you know, a multi-year project of work with about 40 or 50 resources, most of them older than me, most of them technical experts with more technical competence than me and older than me. And so you know, at that stage, I had a CEO that was funding a fantastic leadership program because I was seen as one of the emerging leaders along with 99 of my other peers of the top 100 emerging leaders we all got a chance to kind of pilot his program of work yeah and so I just I just got lucky that at the time that I was thirsting for where and how do I grow out of being a late 20s technical expert yeah into hopefully an early 30s you know executive leader it just smashed right in with this kind of leadership program that John McFarlane was running and because he was so passionate he held his leadership to account Yep. So it wasn't just a program of work you went and did over there for two or three months and then just back to the office. He, he used to really hold his leaders to account and he used to actually measure and monitor people's kind of transformation to the leadership principles that was being espoused by that program. Yeah, great. Do you see kind of uh, echoes of that in your own style today? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think I think um, a lot of the a lot of the um, fabric around um, making sure that you help help the people <laughs> find their their vision through their values and making sure that they are showing up to work because there is that right intersection and for the right purpose and the right meaning stem way back from that from that program probably over 20 years ago yeah yeah fantastic yeah it's funny isn't it it's uh i was actually i went to a meeting this morning and uh, i walked out the meeting and back up collins street and i realized there was something i forgot to cover in the meeting and the first thing i thought is a particular leader I had back earlier in my career, a guy called Keith Lewis, I thought Keith would kick my ass right now because <laughs> uh, I didn't ask that question. Um, and and uh, I mean, that was 15 years ago. But it's incredible that you can still hear the voice yep. um, in the right way. Um, you know, he was an incredible leader, but uh, they, they, they do continue to have an influence and I think impact the way that you think about things today. So I think two things that I, I took away from that, um, that leadership program, particularly at that time, and I'd been on others with KPMG, et cetera, was um, the importance of self-awareness. And so as a consequence, through that decade from 2000 onwards, you know, I must have done every personality profile testing yeah. thing under the sun, whether it was, you know, <coughs> Leadership 360, HDBI, you know, all of them, um, Berkman profiles, yeah. um, you know, whether they were because it was convenient because of teams I was leading to kind of bring it in and we would do it for the whole leadership team or at the time the corporate happened to be doing it, um, every time I had an opportunity to kind of do one of these things, I leant straight into it because every time I learnt something interesting or new about myself, yeah. what my drivers were, where my weak spots were, and I found that that was you know, very valuable. And then when, when you then had to make decisions around what's my next role or is this role that's being offered to me, um, on the path to you know a fulfilling career, I had good collateral to fall back on to say, you know, my 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 personality, my values, and my profiles, 
not not inspired by these things, but definitely inspired by these things. Let me have a look at the role, and do these, do these things start to line up with with the parts of the quadrants around me that are at the right intersection? Yes or no? Right, and I think that was that was particularly important um, as a kind of early, just an early building block in terms of foundational yeah. foundational personal capability to go really understand who you are um, yeah. and who you are as a leader, because then because um, not every leadership role is identical. Yeah. And some will have different challenges, and so you want to make sure that you've got your swimming in a lane where the challenges that you're going to face are the ones that um, are going to grow your gaps, um, but also take advantage of your strengths. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that again, self awareness is, is, is I think critical to to growth. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of people that are very successful, but they don't always know why, uh, or they don't know where their flaws are, or they're not prepared to shine a light on those things and, and, and kind of really work on those things. Um, I'm going to go back to your career story for a That's bit because uh, I'm going to come back to this stuff. But um, I noticed in, in 2010 you joined NAB uh, initially in your comfort zone, I'm going to call it, a kind of Basel three project. Yep. Uh, but you kind of quite quickly after six months moved into an, in, into a role heading up data architecture. So I'm just interested how that transition happened and, and kind of how you went about it. Yeah, so I had... Um, um, the, the gap between was was choosing not to be a project manager for the rest of my life meant that I ended up doing structured finance and corporate finance for about yep. six or seven years. So I had this opportunity to join my accounting, finance and now legal skills in 2001 and join this really emerging, fascinating area called securitisation, which back then was fascinating before the GFC. <laughs> um, and so that was my chance to get in, in front of the customer. That was my chance to be in front of the customer, have to sell products and services and in those days corporate finance to to corporate customers and you know and at that stage I to the point where I became a divisional director at an um, investment bank called Rothschild which was bought by Investec and I had to front the CEO I had to actually get in front of the CEO and convince him why I was going to make my plan and my budget and how much money I was going to make the firm for the next 30 or 90 or 60 days etc um, but that all came to a crashing halt in about 2009 yep. um, structured finance securitization and capital markets were a fraction of themselves um, and so it wasn't really a growth industry. And at the time, what was emerging was globally, all of the regulators were putting in new regulations for all of the banks yeah. because these derivative markets were ma weapons of mass destruction by that stage. Right? So, so I, got, I got a phone call from uh, the CEO of NAB, who was the CEO at ANZ from my previous um, work with the um, ANZ Risk Project, and said, hey, we really need to sort out the risk platforms and the risk systems here at NAB because uh, all of the bales of free tech, um, rules that are coming for derivatives need to be implemented. We've spent a fortune with a consulting firm I won't name um, who reckon this is going to be you know, doable and we need someone to kind of figure that out and implement it. So that's why I joined NAB. Yeah. Um, I was looking for a new challenge. Um, there wasn't a lot happening in structured finance at the stage apart from a lot of infighting because <laughs> when financial markets collapse and a lot of highly paid financial markets expert have not a lot to do, there's a lot of infighting. Um, and it was a chance to be get to back to a more strategic role for a, for a, court, for a bank. Um, and um, and so six weeks into my job, I, I said, look, the consulting firm's advice is sound, but it's not sound for NAB because a lot of the risk architecture and risk systems you have here at the time, it's changed now, but at the time, they haven't changed since we did the ANZ project um, seven years ago because we were familiar with it because NAB was going to part with ANZ on that risk project and reduce the vendor risk, but they didn't, they didn't have the budget or t couldn't get themselves organised. None of those risk systems have changed, so You're right. those risk systems are not ready. Um, so apart from calling out my bravery for basically writing myself out of a job, um, w once I gave them the kind of uh, the detail behind my assessment for why I thought that project was, was not likely to be able to be implemented and I didn't want to risk my reputation, they asked me to become uh, join the um, architecture team more, um, more aggressively to basically come up with the risk architecture roadmap. So, that, so once they had acknowledged my, the shortcomings I'd highlighted, they said, look, we need you to re lead the business architecture team for the risk stream. We need you to go and figure out how are we going to get, because this is not negotiable. We need to get compliant for Dodd-Frank and FATCA. Can you please work in the business architecture team to figure out how we're going to get the right business operating model and the right technology to make sure we can actually meet the regulations in the next three years? Oh, and by the way, uh, we have this, um, we've got a chief data officer for the, for the wholesale bank, which was the, um, the financial markets and, and capital markets businesses, and that person's just resigned. Can you also, as a sideline, do you mind um, 
can, did you mind just picking up the leadership of this particular this data architecture and data data management team just for the next six months while we figure out what we're going to do with the kind of the function of the role because there's some conversation about whether it belongs in technology or belongs sitting under the COO. So um, I kind of pointed out that I hadn't you know I hadn't been a data expert. They <laughs> said yes, you have. You've been on all this risk work for the last 15 years of your life. It's just a leadership role. You'd be right. Yeah. And uh, and here I am, some 15, 16 years later, and yeah, still wow. in a data leadership role, <laughs> loving it. So how did you how did you kind of upskill yourself around data? I think at the, yeah. So at the time it was um, um, because there was so much disruption going on around both the products and the risk management um, um, in banking, and the and the platforms in those days were really really underdone. So. Most banks at that stage had spent a lot of money building their trading platforms in isolation to each other. There wasn't a lot of the platforms connected with um, good data warehouses that were capable of interrogating all the derivative positions globally and holistically. So there was this need in a domain that I had a lot of expertise in, um, which meant that um, when I had data modelling teams and we started having debates and arguments about what was the right data models we should follow to be able to set up the, all of the data warehouses that could capture the data in a way that would be compliant with regulators. I was able to kind of wade into those technical conversations with my domain expertise, yep. and then through a lot of late nights, a lot of arguments, <coughs> and a lot of um, um, disagreements and whiteboard sessions, I was forced to kind of learn um, enough about the both the data architecture principles and practices around um, data ingestion patterns, data modelling, um, data warehousing, um, in order to understand what was going to be the right successful uh, solutions we would put in place that could get us to meet the regulatory meet, um, requirements in the right time frames. And then, of course, then what that also exposed at a, at a more macro level for the bank of at the time was the product architecture was also nowhere near um, yeah, right. uh, in a clean enough state. So, and in... in you know, a decade and a half ago, every new idea for a new for a product became a new product. So even though we you know, realistically have only got a handful of products, home loans and unsecured loans and whatever, we had hundreds of products because every time we had a new special offer for a new interest rate for a particular market, we used to call it a new product. Yeah, right. And of course, the downstream consequences of all that was really complicated systems that had to handle far more products than they really needed to. And so just the opportunity then to play a leadership role in how do we reimagine the product architecture in an organisation to make it more compact and more efficient so that technology could be implemented in a more efficient way. Yeah, got also it. meant that I had a I had a, an opportunity to take both my business and, and banking experience and then sit in the middle of um, data experts and technology experts to shape solutions that meant that we could slim down a lot of the complexity that was in our in our operating model and our technology platforms. Yeah. And then ultimately get to a point where we could actually report, you know, portfolio positions up to regulators. So was this at the point that you became into more of an enterprise architecture type role? Correct. Yeah, got it. Okay. So that's really easy. So it's where the, I guess, I'm also, I'm also a bit reluctant to make these kind of statements, but it's, it's the point when technology was really starting to become the heartbeat of the business in terms of the 100%. way that it was kind of transcending or, or transformation. Uh, trans, trans, my word out transforming uh, kind of the way that these businesses were operating and thinking and, and it sounds like you were just right in the right yeah. place at the right time to and with a passion by the way uh, and I guess the track record to kind of back you to, to go into those roles yeah so I had um I had um I had the opportunity where because I'd been leading a data architecture team for 12 to 18 months and to some extent was on the leadership team for the business architecture team um, just you know the, the organisation at NAB at the time was was trying to find its feet between what was a large global core banking replacement program at the time called NextGen and the wholesale banking divisions trying to figure out how are they going to fix themselves up and set themselves up for a new regulatory environment that was coming and, and remain market competitive and all that other good stuff. And the COO at the time and um, and the CTO, a guy called Tor Esman, again I said I was going to name names but Tor's worth mentioning, I think both had the confidence that said actually um, Darren's commercial nous around how do we set the business up for success makes him an ideal candidate to run the enterprise architecture function, provided the right business architecture leadership, data architecture leadership and technology architecture leadership is put underneath him yeah. um, to make sure that then we get the right blend of what's the right business architecture and processes with the right technology weight and roadmap underpinned by the right data means that we've got the best chance of success to make sure that we don't duplicate investment spend in technology and we sequence it. And it was tough. 
Yeah. Right? Every every business leader wanted their technology fixed tomorrow because post GFC everything was not in a great shape and the pressure on the business in terms of profitability was high. So having to sit in the middle of those tough conversations around everyone wants their system first, but the reality is there is a natural sequence to get those systems in the right order. And if we implemented these operating models and these systems in the right order, we can actually start to remove duplicate platforms and duplicate back offices. Yeah, okay. um, and so I think, um, again, that's where you need to have enough technical knowledge around how the technology worked. You also need to have enough understanding for how the data platforms were going to enable your business to be able to standardise and centralise the current duplicate processes they had yep. um, and then have enough um, executive presence that, that that was a credible story <laughs> in front of, you know, some fairly senior executives who were, you know, MDs of some fairly, fairly uh, important businesses that, you know, interest rate derivative desks and financial markets and foreign exchange were, you know, quite some strong personalities running those businesses. So I think that the, the, the theme there is... Um my takeaway is, you know, don't get lost in just the pure technology aspect here. There's a business problem or business opportunity, depending on me, yep. <laughs> how your cup's full. Yep. Um, but also, you've got to have the influence because you could have the best solution to whatever the problem is. But ultimately, if people aren't going to listen to you or understand that. Um, but also, I guess that influence kind of comes from the track record and reputation that you've built from the way that you delivered across not just that business, but prior, prior roles as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably the, 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 the bit that accelerates the journey for a lot of tech leaders is, is, is you know, build that career, build the reputation, and then let it follow you into places. Because it's much easier for a business to take a chance on someone like yourself going into that role than yep. someone external that may know the technology, but they don't really understand how the organization's operating. Yeah, that's true. And I think I think I was in the fortunate position by the time I'd um, reached my fourth decade um, in, that, in the 2010 period, um, I, had, uh, I had tested my mettle on large-scale change. Um, I had been a program leader on a, large, a number of large programs that had, were all delivering technology. Um, to some extent, because I wasn't um, a, pure, a pure play technology professional that came up from a computer science degree, yep. um, I, didn't, I didn't have favourites in terms of I've got to go with this this brand or this technology because that's been you know in my in my purest technology history I know every time that I've had a problem I've go I go back to this brand or this technology type so to some extent I had slightly more agnostic views around it didn't matter which technology as long as the requirements were written well and as long as the technology team that was um, doing the homework around doing a requirements traceability matrix got their homework done right yep. we would get the most appropriate technology at the at the most appropriate time um, yep. and so I think at that stage. Um, and then I just had the confidence that my leadership uh, now in terms of asking the right question at the right time to uncover the uncomfortable truths that people didn't want to declare <laughs> had got to a reasonable point where, you know, probably six times or seven times out of ten, um, I'd, hear, I'd hear something in the, in the feedback mechanism that's, that, that gave me the insight to maybe drill a bit harder or search a bit further to make sure that the thing that might, that might cause us a problem in six months' time yeah. got the appropriate attention early enough. Yeah. So then, so then, you know, so, and by this stage, I think more and more, the digital revolution was on. 2010 and 12 yeah. was the start of the digital revolution. Everything was talking about social, mobile. Yeah. You know, people forget this, but the iPhone only really came of age around around this those right. those few years of period. So, all of a sudden, the big data was exploding, and so yeah. all of a sudden, people had this dawning recognition that even a bank wasn't. It was just a data business powered by technology. Yeah, got it. And at that point, you you kind of left banking and went into consulting again. Yeah, so back full <laughs> circle uh, with um, Contexty. Yeah, is that right? Uh, as a COO, and obviously, I'm assuming in that role you were probably hands on in, in, from a consultant. Yeah, so I think this is where I really I uh, get really close to technology <coughs> because at this stage, I can see the potential for how um, banks with the right courage could really could really outperform their competitors. Yeah. Um, because all of a sudden, big data was really it was coming. Like, and I was researching it aggressively in my own time. And I could see the opportunity, so I spent I spent a lot of time trying to convince a particular bank that they should invest more heavily in big data technology. Uh, the challenge in those days was the bank was was wedded to a, a large vendor on a big core banking replacement project, so that, so the spare capital and investment finance available for both a data in the first place that wasn't part of the core banking replacement project, yeah. and secondly, like on the front end of the innovation curve, was pretty low. So um, so we real I, I I just couldn't seem to get people. To want to spend money on innovation, um, and I could and I could sense the opportunity. 
Um, and so um, a friend of mine had come back from the US and gone, hey, you should see what's happening in big data in the US. And I kind of yeah. said, I think I know. But he <laughs> said, no, no, you really need to see it. So um, the two of us got together and said, you know what, this is my midlife startup crisis time. So there you go. So um, so we, I left, I left, I left the bank at that point um, with, with the with the express intention to go and build a big data. You know, consulting business that was going to specialise in um, architecture managed services for big data platforms serving corporate Australia. And did you find, because it's interesting, I remember around that time going to a Gartner conference in, in London uh, and I remember seeing a, a slide, I can't remember the exact detail, but roughly speaking, they were saying that there were the amount of, um, if you look at the amount of uh, iterations of the word big data in the media oh, at that time, and then relate that to the spend, it, had, it was the opposite impact compared to maybe what was being spent on cybersecurity or whatever that was not really being spoken about but everyone was chucking cash at it so it was kind of like this 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 big data was was the hottest topic but yeah. trying to find someone that was actually it was prepared, tough because yeah. there was um there was a bifurcation in the global market where digital native companies that just suddenly arrived out of nowhere like the ebays and like yeah. the facebook's which were digitally native in the basis they were built from the ground up on a digital platform that was powered by data we're showing these amazing growth numbers and, and you know becoming these household brands almost mm. overnight within two, three, four years. And what was happening is all of these legacy businesses, you know, bricks and mortar businesses, yep. were being dragged along because all of a sudden they were competing with these digital natives because the customer experience and the customer attention that you need to grab, you were no longer competing with your other banks, you're now competing with the Googles. And, and yep. so the consumer experience of these digital native companies was a consumer experience that a lot of the traditional companies were trying to compete with. Yep. So, of course, though, the challenge there was you couldn't just pivot to having a pure digital native platform. No. So, um, so there's this massive clash of traditional technology and traditional um, operating models. Um, and, and, the, and the challenge we had in Australia, which we learned the hard way at Contexty, was... Um, the technology for big data um, truly was big. And if you were Google trying to index the internet, that was big data. It was petabytes <laughs> and petabytes of data. Even even our, our largest mobile, our largest phone carrier called Telstra at the time was, you know, I don't know, 20 million subscribers. Compared to smart telecommunications in Philippines, which was one of our clients at the time, they had 120 million subscribers. Yeah. So the challenge for Australia was we had um, three, two of the three Vs in big data. We had ver variety and velocity but not the sheer volume. Yeah, okay. That's so in, in Australia, the big challenge was if you were, a, if you were a, um, a CIO of a large corporate and your budget was being you know, cut 10% year on year and you're being asked to do more with less, the, the opportunity to just sweat your existing data warehouse assets or, ex or sweat your existing data platform assets, just that little bit more. We didn't have a lot of unstructured data back in the, in the yep. 2012 to 2016 period. So the real, real commercial driver that you had to be able to ingest, you know, petabytes of unstructured data wasn't there yet. We didn't have large language models back then and Gen AI. Yeah. So, um, so in Australia, it was probably there was this kind of clash where was there really a need, uh, and you only had to look left or right to your nearest competitor, and your nearest competitor was still only experimenting. They weren't disrupting the whole industry. So, yeah. it was really, it was really fascinating to watch how that kind of emerged. And but also, I guess at that point, you and, and probably still true today, not just at that point, but you have to see um, an uptick in revenue or productivity as a result of what you're using the big data for. Yeah. And I think my interpretation at the time is not enough companies c could see or were benefiting from the uptick of, of what the big data was telling them or, or yep. what, the, what the output of the big data was telling them. So one of the four banks at the time did invest heavily in what was called Hadoop. The, the oh, technology yeah. in those days was called Hadoop. People could almost barely remember it because it arrived and disappeared as, it disappeared as quickly <laughs> yeah. as it arrived in Australia, I think. Yeah. Um, and it was only here for three or four years before it was replaced by all of the current modern cloud technologies. Um, but there was one, one of the big four commercial banks was really a ambitious. Um, and a small, a small firm that might have been called Contexty may have helped train, you know, a good yep. couple of hundred of their data analysts and data scientists on that technology way back in 2015 and 16. And I won't declare they are, but if you were to map the share price performance of the four major banks, correlational causation, you'll see that one of those banks has had a stellar track record for the last eight years of constant share price growth and the other and the other three haven't. So yeah, there you go. I, I, won't, <laughs> I won't want to say it's causation. But <laughs> well, the results speak for themselves, I guess. You, um, after kind of wrapping up what you were doing there with Contexty, I, I saw that you, you were... Um, maybe briefly with Tabcor. Yep. Um, so again, a, a, another completely different sector. To yep. in, in some ways, they're in the kind of gaming industry. H how did you kind of find that transition? So, um, 
so the Contexty journey um, was all in on Hadoop. So we, we had we had set a strategy to be the, the red hat for Hadoop in Australia. And okay. as I said before, because we had um, made a big decision to be really specialist in a particular, particularly important but narrow field, the opportunity to scale that company was difficult um, when yeah. the Adiverses and the, and the Snowflakes and all the other technologies came along. Um, and at the time I had an opportunity, we were doing some work for Tabcorp, um, and so there was an opportunity for me to take the data science and, and advanced analytics work that we had been doing as part of our big data work for Contexty and grow it in, in Tabcorp. And Tabcorp at the time had announced a merger or were in the process of announcing a merger for um, uh, with another with another um, gaming company called Tats at the time, and the leadership, the executive leadership at Tapcorp, um, were uh, curious to know whether my uh, leadership qualities would be interested in taking a leadership role to yeah. lead, lead the what would be then the merged company through a a, a, um, a merger and a, the acquisition or the merger at the time. So, at the time, there was some uncertainty as to where Contexty was going to go. Um, given the, the way the market was moving with Hadoop um, and I was kind of well entrenched in doing some fantastic, like we were building some machine learning models for problem gambling at Tabcorp at the time, which were really, really front of the curve at the time. Um, and so the chance to um, uh, get back into a C-suite opportunity um, in a very, very big merger, it was, you know, was going to create a $13 billion market cap company at the time yep. um, and set the entire data strategy, the data roadmap and the data architecture for how for how that kind of merged entity was going to embrace technology and transform their wagering business was just too attractive. So yeah, right. Seems and so. it wasn't banking. I'd left banking, and yeah. uh, you know, well, uh, let's say I didn't think the banking I I community <coughs> was going to be keen to invest in the front edge, as I said before, which is why I left to Contexty. So uh, the opportunity to keep learning, you know, being invested in other industries, um, which had a probably a faster pace around their customer, customer acquisition, customer engagement, all of the fancy stuff around. Uh, next best offer, um, yep. all of, all of that stuff, which was fairly new to the Australian market in 2014 to 2015. Mm. Tabcorp was a perfect um, opportunity to um, test that. Um, well, the, the, the gaming market's transformed enormously, hasn't it, through the technology revolution? You think you know it used to be placing a bet on a horse at the the bookies, and as you say now, some of the sophistication of the the the, the way that you can construct bets and so forth is ultimately driven by that that data set. Yeah, and it's um, and and the things that um, the thing I was attracted to about the Tabcorp, which I started my life there, was building a bunch of sophisticated advanced league solutions for helping um, uh, helping customers identify problem gambling habits, um, okay. and so and so the technology and the smarts around advanced analytics on identifying betting patterns that potentially were going to be harmful. Obviously, with the same with the same patterns, sa the same some of the same tools, and technologies to understand whether in fact they were the sort of the sort of betting behaviours that said, "Hey, actually, we should only show you and serve you up, you know, activity that you think is of interest or relevance to you as a customer, and not the stuff that's not relevant to you." So that whole personalisation journey, yep. um, sports bet, I got to <coughs> say, were pioneers of that, in, in, um, and and Tabcorp was a very very fast follower. Well, again, it's that 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 kind of traditional industry, and you spoke before there about digital natives. Uh, and the changing consumer behaviour and the expectation of, of, of what people are getting. You, you kind of moved on from that role in, in sort of 2019 and kind of went back into a, a similar space with MLC Life, which obviously at the time was going through that demerger from NAB and, and essentially standing up a business yep. uh, as, as quick as they, they possibly could. And it was also a pretty challenging time uh, yep. for, for that organisation going through that. What, what kind of drew you to that, that role? I think um, so. The the Tabcorp role, um, the merger had happened. Um, the strategy and roadmap for the data governance and the data platform um, had been set. I, I just achieved the board approval for the transformation work for um, for the whole customer personalization, um, Martech transformation that Tabcorp continued to drive after I left. So that, so at the point Tabcorp had kind of gone through that kind of uh, reset the strategy get it in place, start growing it, and now I was at a point where largely my role there was going to be almost, again, a program manager. Yep. As the next couple of years, a lot of, a lot of investment was going to get implemented. About 30 or $40 million of the investment was going to be implemented yep. as opposed to new investment into the next phase of, you know, um, um, customer 360 view. There was a bunch of other things that Tabcorp was ripe for at the time but not ready for in terms of there was only so much investment spend that they could consume in a particular period of time. Yep. And right at that time... MLC Life had been through a challenging period where um, some of their some of their separation programs 
which were meant to stand up a brand new data capability hadn't worked. Mm. Um, MLC Life was interesting because it was being separated from NAB, so it had been purchased by Nippon, and so you had a 135-year-old startup. Yes. What, what that meant was the business had been around for 135 years, but because you couldn't take any of National Australia Bank's systems with it, they had to stand up every single system mm. right down to their Skype in those days, <laughs> um, right down to every single telephone, every single computer, e- yeah. every single piece of infrastructure had to be built from scratch and rebuilt from the ground up. So there was this absolutely um, interesting playpen of how do, you bu- how do you build a brand new business quickly from everything from CRM systems to policy administration yep. systems, the whole lot. And, of course, one of the glaring gaps they needed, all of that needed to be powered by data. So um, yep. so there were there were a few people in the MLC leadership team that had worked with it at, at, in my pre nab days. Yeah, okay. um, and they said, hey, we need to build a whole data capability from scratch. The project was um, hoping to build some of it, but they haven't in the last 12 months, and now we're kind of behind the eight ball. Yep. Um, and so we'd like... We'd, are you interested in the leadership opportunity to bring that all together? And... Um, and the thing that attracted me about life insurance, it's one of the few industries where the alignment between the customer's long-term health is aligned because as a life insurance company, if, if, if we can get past the adversarial uh, relationship of a claims process and do that with good data and actually start to convince customers that if you, if you were prepared to share more data with us securely and privately and we were able to compare your data with other, other customers, we might be able to give you some good advice on... Yep. Some, on some strategies you could do to change your lifestyle yeah, okay. because if you can live a longer life in a healthier state then the premiums we need to charge for your life insurance start to drop yeah and realistically no one no no other corporate in, in on the planet has that same motivation not even not even your health insurance companies all they care about is just making sure the cost of your health service in the next 12 months is as low as possible right? yes so that that part of it resonated with me you know that lifelong passion for health and fitness so yeah, great. Yeah. The potential to build a data capability for an industry that potentially could help um, improve the long-term health of Australians, um, I thought was an ideal opportunity. It's an interesting that look. I, I, many people wouldn't look at it that way, but I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I remember actually at the time working with MLC Life and uh, talking to people in the business about you know, most of the time when we actually speak with our customers, it's actually the worst time of their life. Or yep. They're going through some of the worst moments. Um, you know, so how we can help the person through the process of making that claim with, with you know, when they're already having to deal with grief, etc. It's, it's you know, an important part of what we're trying to stand up. Um, for, also the one, for, the, for the 1% of Australians who actually find out the real value of life insurance, yeah, it's, it's an absolute game changer. Right? Yeah. And that's the issue. It is insurance. And so 99% of Australians are just frustrated they have to pay premiums for the damn thing. But there's 1% of right. Australians who, you know, and the industry spends something like $12 billion a year paying out to 1% yeah. of Australians who truly have an unexpected life event whose family and loved ones are in, you know, much better shape than they could be without it. So, yeah. And it is that 1% that means that, you know, people who do work in a life insurance company and have to speak to customers and hear the story of, of the father who's going to die of cancer in the next three months and leaves yeah. behind a wife and three young kids, it is compelling, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also remember at that time, not long after you joined, meeting for you, uh, you, you won't recall this meeting, I'm sure, but we met in Longshot for a coffee, and you you uh, started talking through your data strategy. Um, and I've got to say, it was, it was incredibly, incredibly compelling. Uh, I think one of your strengths is as a storyteller. Um, I mean, seriously, you were talking about data lakes, and I didn't know what that was, but I wanted to put on the scuba gear. Right? I was I was excited about data lakes. Um, I'm just interested in how did you how did you kind of develop that skill as a storyteller as a, as part of your leadership style? I think uh, I think it was um, the early formation of that was back to my early KPMG consulting days. Yeah. Because uh, I think what what having the f- been the fortunate position to being in consulting at a young age um i, I learned from some masters around um uh, ultimately for a consultant to be worth their money there needs to be a compelling message that drives a decision and an action yeah and so i think and i had some i had some tough task masters i had some i had some partners early on that used to scream down the phone back in the days because it was phones there was no zoom <laughs> um and scream at me about the ordinary crap that I was writing and this is just black shit on white paper you might have to edit that out but you know like I had some really tough taskmasters <laughs> early on that used to frustrate me but it was it was it was um it was um good homework for me because yeah it it forced me to constantly think about what's the right message on the page that we're trying to put here that is actually the 
the sharpest encapsulation of the problem statement and the opportunity going forward. And I think, um, and and I think in a lot of cases, because I was running large programs of work with technology, a lot of the people I had influence were a lot older than me at the time, with a lot more, you know, corporate experience. So, um, so I think that was again just sitting in, you know, being on, on that, on playing in that field. Yeah. Um, it forced me to sharpen my tools and wit around um, a making sure I had. Uh, done enough of my homework and research to make sure I had my facts w- well established um, and then that I could combine the facts in a way that said, does this make sense to the, to the sense that it kind of resonates with you, right? And yep. if it doesn't, I'm going to keep doing my homework till it does. So I think that was just, that was the kind of like, and that was just um, the early building blocks, I think. And then, um, and I think that was, and because I always played this role as the mediator, collaborator between business strategy financial outcomes for a shareholder that met the customer need and the technology that needed to enable it, that need to kind of bring three or four parts of a business, mostly banking, but not always banking, to the yep. table um, meant that uh, I was constantly trying to find middle ground for people. Yeah. That meant that um, I could then take a technical topic and then convert it to enough of a, um, a non-technical topic that it, it resonated with enough stakeholders yeah, that they could okay. get to a consensus. Because the thing I did learn early on at, at um, NAB with some leadership on a program was, you know, the cycle of value is is to align, act and then adjust. Yeah. So get alignment first and it might feel like you're going slow. If you spend an extra couple of months getting that alignment first, then you act, the chance that you get to the year down the track and realise yeah. you're heading down the wrong path is a lot lower. Whereas everyone's so desperate to prove their worth or prove that they're doing something and everyone's so desperate to make sure before 30th September or 30th June we've got something yep. done, everyone jumps to act. Yeah. Then they jump to adjust because they didn't <laughs> act right. And then a year later when it's all a train wreck and we've all wasted a lot of money, then they try and get alignment, right? Yeah. And so I think I've always carried with me one of the principles, which is always align before you act and then adjust. And, and that requires good storytelling. To get that alignment requires good storytelling. Yeah, that's great. How important do you think storytelling as well as in, in, in terms of the ability to put together a good team? Um, in the world we keep moving to, it becomes more and more important. Yeah. As more and more of the technology and the technology tools become more automated um, and, and more and more of the business operating model itself becomes more automated, um, the decisions around what parts of that automation, what parts of that te- technology to invest in and why is more around what's the customer outcome you're aiming to achieve that's going to keep shareholders happy enough in the short term and long term. All of that comes back to storytelling. Yeah. Because um, the, the complexity of the business means that combination of, of getting the business architecture and the processes right sized to take advantage of just enough of the technology at the right time, that that is so much the, the complexity and the speed at which the world changes so much means that that becomes so much more about richer conversations between um, yeah. technical specialists that sit in different domains that I think the storytellers are going to become more important. And as Gen AI becomes more of a thing and large language models become more of a thing and prompt engineering becomes more of a thing, yeah. it's going to be the philosophers and storytellers, ironically, yeah. who are going to become the most powerful uh, agents of change more so than the data scientists and the quant in the future. Yeah, interesting. It's actually a question I asked, uh, I did a poll on LinkedIn yesterday. Um, future skills, what's going to be more important, AI or EI? Because <laughs> uh, I think um, that's going to be quite interesting. I think both both have to kind of come together uh, to, to, to really get the value is, uh, is probably my view. But um, I'm going to keep going. So we, we you, you then left MLC Life and returned to NAB. Yeah. Um, so you've been away for about six years, I think, at, at that point. What, what changed in the time you left? <laughs> Yeah, so either extremely courageous or extremely stupid to go back. Um, <laughs> you, you, you said it. I was. I was yeah. <laughs> no, no. I know you're thinking it. That's okay. Um, and I may have quoted it to a few of my teams in some of my some of my town halls. Um, I, I think um, a couple of things uh, had changed. One was, um, particularly uh, in Nab's case, um, I've, I've got I've got the privilege of having some personal friendships uh, with some great data leaders. Um, one of them was, in fact was doing my role for Ross McEwen way back when Ross was running retail at, at CBA. So um, so when, when somebody came knocking on the door to say, hey, are you interested in a data leadership at NAB? And I said, you're kidding me, I've been there. <laughs> they said, no, 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 he, hear us out, hear us out. I had a friend of my ear saying, you should listen because 
in the time that I spent with Ross at CBA, he was a very data-driven executive. Um, he'd already made the choice to appoint an executive for digital and data in Angela Mentis at the time, which again was unique for banks. Um, and and I met the current chief data analytics operator officer, which is Christian Ellison, and and his philosoph- his philosophy on how to get the right balance around governance and platform and technology and analytics um, resonated with me in terms of the philosophy. So, um, and and in my mind, I think the banking industry is absolutely at the the forefront of some tremendous transformation. Like, uh, like in terms of um, um, the cyber risks that, are, that they're constantly playing with, you know, they're, they're five or six years out of the post-Royal Commission kind of um, change and transformation. Um, the uh, the Gen AI disruption that's, that's coming, the digital natives that it's competing with. Yeah. Um, um, and so, you know, from my perspective, um, the, the banks that struggled to make investments in data some 14 years ago were now all of a sudden like aggressively making good investments in data to try and um, take advantage of being on the front of the curve around, you know, analytics powered by data, not, yeah. not technology, you know, um, uh, technology um, storing the data. So for yeah. me, um, I do see the banking and finance community as being one of the one of the huge pivotal communities that are at the forefront, and and will be one of the pivotal I- areas that will be totally disrupted by Gen AI. So yeah. um, I do see that as the next big data moment that's coming. Yeah. And so uh, insurance banking and life um, insurance and banking in particular are going to be um, right at the centre of of all that disruption. You've, uh, you've you probably answered my next six questions. I was going to ask you about the intersection with tech and, and banking, sort of going forward, and kind of where you saw data. Um, I guess probably then more broadly, what so what you've, you've talked about Gen I numerous times, but is that the thing that kind of excites you the most about what's happening in uh, in the world of technology right now? Yep. Uh, yes, like uh, like by a country mile. Yeah. Um, and the excitement for me is. Um, uh, all the technologies have been around for a while. Machine learning's been around for a long time, but we finally got we finally got the unit cost of production down to a low enough cost <coughs> way back in the early 2000s that suddenly machine learning and personalization and all that sort of stuff became a thing. Um, the, um, the, um, uh, the large language model and natural language processing has also been a thing, but again, the unit yeah. cost of production to do large language models at scale and product and and, and at, um, at computational intensity wasn't there, but all of a sudden with GPUs and the absolute, you know, um, acceleration of the compute technology has meant now all of a sudden on a daily basis, new large language model technology is becoming um, unbelievably sophisticated and unbelievably useful at such a like, rapid pace. But each of these things in isolation. So traditional, um, what I call traditional AI, so traditional machine learning and um, and data science work, by itself interesting and valuable and has been. Large language models and, and um, generative AI by itself interesting. But you start blending these things together yeah. along with what was another topic that was hot about five or six years ago, which is RPA. Yeah. Um, those things in isolation are interesting. Those three things in concert becomes revolutionary for the world, right? And the reason I say that is because I can make predictions about um, about customers and their propensity to buy products or predictions about problems and gambling and all sorts of stuff. I can also have a, a wonderful chatbot answer questions around, you know, how do I get a better interest rate on my loan? So each of those individually are nice and they will, you know, improve the efficiency and effectiveness of delivery of service to customers by fractions of. Yep. But the minute I start bringing these things together, the minute I can start to basically naturally... Um, you know, have a large language model interpret every policy and every PDS in my entire company's product suite and its history, communicate with the customer in a voice, an AI-generated voice that is that is equivalent to the call centre operator I have today, and I can run an RPA process that actually completes the application form for the customer and gets that done without the human touching it, that's that's going to be a game-changer, right? Yeah, interesting. It, so if you t- taken taken that kind of outlook on where, where things are going to go next, if we were kind of sitting here and uh, you were sort of two or three years out of university um, and you were thinking about where you would start to focus yourself to, to upskill or get ready for the, the next, 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 what's going to happen next, what, what would you be doing? So it's topical because my eldest has just finished university and oh, he's going off into his career. So 
And so despite never going to do what Dad's doing, he's at least doing cyber security, but not, not specifically yeah. data, but he, he still does dabble in Power BI from time to time, so he still does something fun to my heart. <laughs> um, so the conversations that I've had with him as a, as a, as a litmus test are around the fact that um, you absolutely want to uh, be as close to technology as you can, as much as your passion and patience um, can enable it, because the world will continue to be powered by technology, and that's just going to get more and more. Um, you may or may not need to be deeply, deeply expert in, write, in being the best software engineer and writing the most amazing code, because I think the tools and technologies are coming yes. that are going to basically um, start to automate a lot of that, and arguably I've heard stats that 40% of what's now being submitted to GitHub already is starting to be written by large language models. So there's, there is a revolution coming around, around how the the technology itself is going to rewrite the technology, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but that, that intersection of, of hum, humanity being powered by technology, enabled by technology, is going to continue to go on a, on a Moore's law curve, right, accelerating. Um, and so therefore, you've got to still find your passion. So there's no point following a career that's not linked to your values because you've got to jump out of bed in the morning and want to, want yep. to do it. So you've got to find what your passion is and your, and your interest is. Um, most passions and interests now have some connection to technology, even if you want to be a, a, a movie producer. The reality yes. is there's a reason Hollywood's on strike is because you can now generate yep. um, videos, high-quality videos with large language models by prompting a large language model, which, you know, if you had have asked me two years ago, was that even possible? I would have said that was sci-fi, right? Yep. So even creative arts are, being, are being, going through quite a, quite a transformation now. So, so having an eye on on where that's going and understanding where and how you can leverage that so that yeah so that you can not only invest in your passion but invest more of your time and energy yep. in that passion because the things that can be automated or made away can be even at a personal level but also from a career perspective like i think from here on people have to have an eye on where is the world of of, of automation and technology going because it's going to it's going to disrupt quite a bit yeah right okay and i think um, lawyers and doctors all of that Educators, lawyers, doctors and educators, anything that has relied on language and the encapsulation of written knowledge as being your, your secret source to your, yep. to your profession are all going to go through changes. And the change will start with augmentation. Yep. I will no longer need to read the 7,000 published medical research papers a day get published. 7,000, right? I will no longer need to find the 100 that are relevant to my field of study and, and read them every morning at 3 o'clock in the morning. I can get a large language model like ChatGPT to summarise those 100 every morning and just, give me the fa and just give me the salient points. So there'll be a whole augmentation play, whether it be a lawyer, whether it be a doctor or an educator, and at some point the revolution will come where, we, where the augmentation becomes replacement of some level of those industries. Yeah, great. So that's so, so the, the, the first step is in, in many ways it's understanding how to interface with it and the kind of prompt engineering if you like or the the ability to to prompt because these things can not, not pretty much do anything but there's a lot of things that they can do if they're pointed in the right way yep um and i think that's going to be interesting seeing the 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 kind of tools and the interfaces that come out because i think your average person is not going to really develop that skill set i think it's going to be the products that they that they don't don't even know we're doing those things underneath the hood correct um that, that they're going to give them that access um, and that's probably my personal reticence with something like ChatGPT. I see most people using it like Google. Um, and that's not really the, it's, it's a different tool. Um, it's not really designed for that, for that kind of purpose. Um, look, that's, that's probably the technical side covered. I guess looking back at your own career from a kind of behavioral yep. aspect, you know, what kind of advice would you give someone in terms of how to go about, I guess, setting themselves up for success in a, in a career? Um, so uh, I think I said earlier that I did I did invest heavily on um, understanding my own personality and understanding my, mm. my the self awareness journey on making sure I understood my strengths and weaknesses. One of the things that's always highlighted that's popped out consistently, no matter which tool I've used, is that I'm um, I'm I'm powered by learning. So I'm um, I'm just one of these people that's uh, I'm just I'm seriously sat dissatisfied with whatever it is you know today. You know, I couldn't believe that I used to have a Cassiopeia back in the days when Palm Pilots and Cassiopeias <laughs> were a thing. I'm showing my age again. Yeah. And I had a mobile phone and I'm like, why can't we just smash these things together? And, if, you know, so I was always an early adopter of a lot of tech because I was always... Yeah. But I was always curious to understand kind of why was this the way it was. And I think having that, um, that curiosity for why are things working... And my parents used to get frustrated. I used to pull a start part stuff that used to work. 
And of course, as a 10 or 11 year old, because I was curious to see how it all worked, I could never get quite back together. Yeah. So whenever something was broken, I could just hear my dad screaming from the garage, did I, did I touch this? Have I actually touched yeah. this? Right. <laughs> so I always had this kind of thirst to um, understand how things um, were built and, and worked. Um, and, and I always had this thirst to learn and learn more. And I think, um, I think that has put me in good stead to be um, agile to the things that have emerged that are interesting yeah. and, and for me intellectually stimulating. Um, it's also meant that for me personally, uh, behaviourally, I've, I've known that um, if you need somebody just to run that particular function well and just optimise it for, for the next 5 or 10% year on year for the next three years, yeah. it's probably not a role for me. Like yeah, okay. it's not. It's just yeah. you know some people like the um, uh, are driven and powered by the um, uh, by the science around how do I how do I optimize team and team performance and how do I optimize existing process and da da da. Not for me. So so behavioural. I've always been driven by um, what's the change that what's the big change that's coming um, and 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 where and how can I stimulate my intellect yeah. to learn where that change is going to go next and and bring a bunch of smart people together to figure out how we can how we can make that a positive influence for good. I, I also noticed the theme as you were you were talking through your career of, of I'm going to call it doing the right thing. Uh, and what I mean by that is you went into I think it was NAB we talked about and six weeks in said pretty much you don't need me. You kind of backed yourself out of a job. Which yep. you, I think you described as you know, foolhardy or brave. I'm not sure yep. the phrase you used, but you did the right thing. Um, and I think equally when you're talking about contexty and, and Hadoop. You, know, you recognise. Well, hang on a minute. This text, this you know, other things have overtaken it. The the the, the moment's passed. Um, I think that's a big thing as well. I think you know some people wed themselves to a career path or a technology, and yep. they kind of ride it to death. Yep. Um, and they they don't know when to give up and move on to something else. And uh, maybe I'm wrong, but my interpretation from th- a few things you've said today is that that's that's probably a skill that you've got. Yeah, I think I, I think uh, probably by good fortune, I think early on when. Early in my career, when I was probably less concerned about mortgages and less concerned about things around, you know, and I was in a, a very aggressive learning phase. And as I said before, when you're in accounting and consulting firms, y- y- your your the, their secret sources they enamour you with the learning opportunity rather than the um, rather than the wage. Um, and so I think at that stage, what was ingrained in me was the um, if you if you deliver your best work and it's work that you believe has a higher purpose, then the the universe will do right by you, right? Yeah, okay. And so, and because I was always a chartered accountant at heart, at, as as my earliest training, I always found that whenever I was making decisions around um, any of the corporate conflicts that naturally emerge when when time, scope, quality, and resources all ca- all clash, yeah. um, you know, number one was was this right for the for the shareholder? What, was this ultimately right for the commercial outcome of the business, powered by a customer outcome that was positive? Yeah. I always had that lens, and if I, I figured if I always had that lens, and and then always did the intellectual homework to back myself on 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 the reasons for that, then if the corporation then turned around and said we still don't agree with you, Darren, as far as I was concerned, that wasn't the right corporation for me. Yeah, okay. and that's probably why I had five jobs in the first eleven or twelve years of my life, right? Yeah, okay. Which which is because I was I kind of stayed faithful to that because I had a bunch of mentors in my early KPMG days that I think that were just prepared to give me the kind of some big, tough, challenging roles. I found I excelled at them, and guess what? They gave me the next big, challenging role. So, so again, what 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 again? I've heard there is that you knew your kind of personal values and what you're aligned to, and you weren't going to compromise. Um, and you you were happy to back yourself and, and keep finding the right place to to align to what you wanted to achieve. Uh, actually, I think the other thing that, um, and again, back to that John McFarlane program I mentioned earlier. I think you know back when I was in a very formative stage at my late twenties. Once I decided I was all in on leadership, so I was going to make leadership my career, right? So, so all this other stuff was the sideline on where to deploy my leadership, but my primary career was going to be leadership. The other thing I found is the things that I know energise me to get out of the bed in the morning is I have much more energy at the end of the day when I've had career conversations with my team. Yeah. When I've asked my team to you know, self-reflect on what they could have done better around how they've led their teams... That whole, like I find my passion is actually now, particularly at my stage of my career, is more around how do I, how do I help my, my, my leadership team and my direct reports and, and any of the people in my network yep. grow, grow to become better leaders and be more inspired about you know, leaving a better footprint on humanity. I think um, that's my real passion, right? And the rest of it now 
is the intellectual interest to keep my intellectual stimulation going, yep. um, to give me a reason and a currency to give me the practical examples on where and how I can help others grow and grow their kind of leadership in their careers. So yeah, my actual right. real passion these days is as much as it is about the technology, but it's around the human, yeah. the human, the, the human um, impact of that technology and that technology change, and what it means for communities and tribes of people to work together and show leadership. We're, we're starting to kind of stray into Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I feel like here a bit. Uh, um, what what uh, these are going to be many uh, a few sporadic questions randomly about I guess about more broadly about your career. Um, what would you say was the most significant feedback you've received during your career? Um, yep, uh, I was in the cab on the way to a client, which was Suncorp Metway in its day, uh, and Princess Diana had died, and it was on the news, um, and I, that's why I remember the day. And um, we were in some particularly tough workshops with Suncorp Metway executive, and I was just this young, you know, mid twenties consultant working with a partner. Again, wasn't going to name drop, but Colin Flynn, another inspirational leader for me. Colin Flynn um, uh, now runs. Um, uh, MD for financial services for Accenture. He was in the back of the cab with me and giving me some feedback about the workshop we've just been running. And I was getting frustrated because we weren't we weren't getting to the easy answer because I had to get this we had to get these workshops done. We had to come up with our recommendations. And I was just getting frustrated because I knew that it was going to be on me to get, pull this stuff together. And he's just like, cut it out. He said, There is no black and white in life, Darren. There's only shades of grey. And you keep hunting for black and white. You keep thinking there's the perfect answer. But let me tell you, there isn't the perfect answer. And so if you can't get comfortable playing the grey space, then you better change careers very quickly. <laughs> so that has stuck with me for 30 years because um, I think you asked that question around storytelling. And it was a real check because at this point I'm like, I'm the paid expert in the room. You know, the partner is just there to kind of manage the relationships and make sure everything's heading in the right direction. But I'm being looked on to be the technical expert. Yeah. And so I'm expecting him to be on my back around when we're going to have the perfect answer. And so I'm getting frustrated with the customer. I'm getting frustrated with him. And he's like, back down. You, yeah. you, you, are, you are pushing too hard thinking that the world has got a black and white answer and there's never a black and white answer. And, and, I've, and I've taken that with me forever, which is the world is shades of grey. Okay. And and there is never the perfect answer. There is just the combination of people's facts and people's opinions, and even that's not perfect. Yeah, there you go. Get comfortable with imperfection. Get comfortable with imperfection. Yeah. What um what are you most proud of in your career? Um, probably my um, my agility to take on something new and have the courage to take it on, um, and take some risks. And the fact that 20 and 30 years later, I still have personal connections with people that yep. I built teams around. There are, there are, there's, a, there's a handful of us, and I don't attend as frequently as I should, but there's a handful of us that still get together 25 years after the ANZ project yep. on a monthly basis and still share war stories about where we are today. Um, the things I'm proud about the most is I still get phone calls and I still have connections with, with a trail of people that I've grown teams with um, and 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 had phone calls from people that I've worked with and or been led by. So just that 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 community that I've built over the last 30, 30, 30 years of, of corporate life is still a community that I can and do have phone calls and meetups with, um, which tells me that's a community, like it's a real community. Yeah, um, fantastic. And not just, not just resources that I manage at a particular point in my time. Yeah. Um, and barked a bunch of instructions to that they followed or didn't follow, but yeah. actually had a positive influence where, yeah. you know, they gave something to me in terms of learning and understanding around me as a person and my leadership. And, and a number of them have, you know, in the years that have since gone by, I've become personal friends. And I think that's something I'm most proud of. Yeah, it's great. If you were to, um, and I've kind of asked this question, I guess, indirectly through, throughout, but if you were to kind of crystallise one singular piece of sage advice that you were to give to the next generation... <laughs> What would it be? Oh, gosh. That wasn't on the pre-brief. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, the world is geared up in a way to make you feel like destruction is at your doorstep. And uh, the, political, the political environment, the media environment, all of that is architected in a way to set you up for a state of fear. Yeah. And the reason for that is because fear sells. As human beings, uh, we're still wired from our ancestral days when 
our response to fear is 10 times more amplified than our response to joy. And so, and the media understands that and the commercial enterprise that sits behind it understands that. So you will always be fed far more negative information uh, than is reality. And my sage advice is work hard to look at the positive opportunities that are actually coming, not, not be completely devoid of the risks that are coming, but don't buy into the world is about to end and the world yeah. is about to be destroyed. Because I think the biggest killer for our youngest generation is that there's a narrative going around that the planet can't sustain more than a billion people and the climate's going to get wrecked and all this sort of stuff. And the reality is the, the climate and the world will constantly go through change. The human beings will always figure out ways to move it forward. And my constant advice is resist the temptation to wallow in the story of misery because the media will be in your face telling that story because that's, yeah. that's what sells attention. And find a way to look to the positive so that when you find your passion for what gets you out of bed in the morning and you, and you find work that matches your values and your passion, you'll find you're actually never working. You're doing yeah. what you love and loving what you're doing. And, and you've got to fight the negative, the negative stories that come that the world's about to end to get there. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, thank you. Actually, it, the minute you said that, it reminded me of uh, something I haven't heard for many years, but uh, someone once said to me, remember that fear and greed drive most behaviours. Correct. Um, and, and most profits. And most profits, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to go completely left field. Um, I'm always, uh, we record these at the State Library. Uh, I'm always interested in kind of what people read or what they're reading and uh, to be able to kind of, again, recommend on to others. Um, yep. What's kind of, what's on your read list at the moment? So um, on the basis that um, I, I do have a 21-year-old that's just left university and, and is about to fulfil their amazing career in cybersecurity, I also have a three-year-old, um, so I couldn't <laughs> yeah. resist but to have that COVID baby like a few people. Um, so there's a, a bunch of books piled up that aren't being read, but as a consequence, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts because okay. I, still, I still enjoy the privilege of being able to ride my push bike to and from work and the five days a week I'm in the office. And so my podcasts are typically filled with a combination of um, uh, Gen AI topics and, um, and the architecture that's coming and, and the revolution of, that's coming around Gen AI. Yeah. Um, um, I do spend a lot of time listening to Peter Diamandis and um, he has a podcast around moonshots. Back to yeah. my earlier point about keep an eye on where the positive future of the world's coming rather mm. than just the negative. Um, and I am, I am spending a lot more time, given the complex world we live in, listening to um, debates between the likes of a Jordan Peterson and a yeah. Sam Harris yeah. and, hearing, and hearing the different stories around um, uh, what is faith and what is belief because there's this huge narrative around will the transforming world of Gen AI and, and AI generally mm. become a consciousness and what is consciousness? So I'm also, again, intrigued to understand on the basis that I don't believe humans, that human beings have ever actually even defined consciousness. Yep. Is there even a chance that, that technology <laughs> powered by software is going to come up with a consciousness? So it's actually led me down a path unexpectedly into, yeah. um, into a lot more um, research and understanding around human philosophy and ideology. Yeah, so that, that, that curiosity never sleeps. That curiosity never <laughs> sleeps. <laughs> Thanks for your time. You've been oh. incredibly generous with your time today, so thank you. No, no, thanks for the opportunity. It's been great to chat. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Tales from Tech Tysons, and be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcast. If you'd like to get more insights about tech careers, then check out the Ember, that's e double -M -M -E -R, LinkedIn page, for the latest updates, articles, and engaging discussions.